Hi guys, welcome back. Um, I hope you liked our last chapter book. Uh, we have another one for you. I've never actually read this one, so I'm hoping it's really good. But the author, I've liked a lot of her other books. But it is Beverly Cleary's Socks. All right, let's get started. Socks. Chapter one, the kitten sale. The tabby kitten hooked his white paws over the edge of the box marked kittens, 25 cents or best offer. The girl with the stringy hair and sunburned arms picked him up and set him down in the midst of his wiggling, crawling, mewing brothers and sisters. He wanted to get out. She wanted him to stay in. The puzzling struggle had gone on all morning in the space between the mailbox and the newspaper near door, newspaper rack near the door of the supermarket. Nice fresh kittens for sale, called out the girl, whose name was Debbie. She usually held the kitten in her arms, and he expected her to hold him now. Stupid, said her brother George, embarrassed to be selling kittens with his younger sister on a summer morning. Who ever heard of fresh kittens? Me, said Debbie, as she pushed a kitten down once more. Then she repeated at the top of her voice, nice fresh kittens for sale. She knew she was not stupid, and she, annoyed, she enjoyed annoying her brother. The two had quarreled at breakfast. George said Debbie should sell the kittens because she played with them, and that made them hers. Debbie said George should sell the kitchen, the kittens, because she didn't know how to make change. Besides, he was the one who had brought the mother home when she was a kitten, so that made her kittens his. Their father said, Stop bickering, you two. You can both sell them. And that was that. The white-pawed kitten, unaware of the hard feelings between brother and sister, tried again. He stepped onto another ki kitten, and this time managed to lift his chin over the rim of the carton. His surprised blue eyes took in the parking lot full of shoppers, pushing carts among cars glittering in the summer heat. He was fascinated and frightened. Now, socks, said Debbie, as she unhooked his claws from the cardboard, be a good kitten. Socks' orange and white sister caught his tail and bit it. Socks rolled over on his back and swiped at her with one white paw. He no longer felt playful towards a, towards a litter mate who bit his tail. Now that he was seven weeks old, he wanted to escape from all the rolling and pouncing and nipping that went on inside the box. Unfortunately, no shopper was willing to buy Socks' his freedom. Sarah paused to smile at the sign, and then Socks found himself shoved to the bottom of the heap by Debbie. What are you going to do with all the, all the money when you sell the kittens? asked an elderly woman who was lonely for her grandchildren. Daddy says we should save up to have the mother cat shoveled so she won't have kittens all the time, said, answered Debbie. Spade, corrected George. She means he said we should have the mother spade. Oh, my, said the woman, and hurried to the... Uh, Hurried into the market. So there's George, Debbie, and the elderly woman talking at the mailbox. Stupid, said George. Anyway, Dad was joking, I think. This time, Debbie looked as if she agreed with her brother that she might be stupid. What are we going to do, she asked, as she plucked socks from the edge of the carton once more. Nobody wants them. Marked them down, I guess. Dad said to give them away if we had to. The boy borrowed a felt tip marker felt tip pen from a checker in the market, and while Socks peered over the edge of the carton, crossed out the 25 cents on his sign and wrote 20 cents above it. Kittens for sale, Debbie's voice sounded encouraging as she hid Socks under two of his litter mates. He promptly wiggled out. On a day like this, his own fur was warm enough. Why do you keep hiding Socks? George tried to look as if he just happened to be standing there by the mailboxes and had nothing to do with the kittens. Because he's the best kitten, and I want to keep him, said Debbie. Dad won't let you, her brother reminded her. He says the house is getting to smell like cats. Socks found himself plucked from the litter and cradled in the girl's arm. Well, at least we can find a good home for him. Debbie was admitted, admitting the truth of her brother's statement. I don't want just anybody to take Socks. You don't see a lot of people forming to buy kittens, do you? asked George. 
past the time he had read the headline of the newspapers in the rack and the label on the mailbox and was starting in on the signs posted in the windows of the market. Socks tried to climb Debbie's t-shirt, but she held him back while she watched the faces of shoppers for signs of interest. One man approached, but he only wanted to drop a letter in the mailbox. A woman paused long enough to look at each kitten and then say, No, I can't, bear think to, I can't bear to think of anything as warm and furry as a kitten on such a hot day. Children entering the market with their parents begged to be allowed to buy a kitten. Just one, please, please, with their own, very own money. But no one actually bought a kit kitten. I guess it just isn't kitten weather, said Debbie. Socks struggled, struggled to free himself from the heat of the girl's sweaty arms. Be good, Socks, said Debbie. We're trying to find you a nice home. Fat chance, George had finished reading the signs in the windows and was even more bored. Special prices on ground beef and soap and announcements of cake sales did not interest him. A woman with her hair in rollers wearing a moo-moo and rubber thong sandals headed, sorry, herded three children and a tired-looking mongrel across the parking lot. The tallest girl, barely old enough to read, shrieked, Mommy, look! A kitten sale! I want one! I want one! shouted her younger brother and sister. Debbie and George exchanged a look. The dog, sensing a long argument, laid down in front of the market door where customers had to step over him. Panting used up all his energy, and he had none left with which to investigate kittens. I want that one with white feet, said the boy, who was wearing a new swimming trunks. I saw him first, the younger girl shoved her brother. Cut it out, you two, ordered the mother, guiding her brood across the traffic lane. Not socks, please, not socks. There was desperation in Debbie's whisper. Socks could feel thumping beneath her t-shirt as she held him closer. They're the, they're the kind that will squeeze him and don't forget, and forget to give him water. I can tell. George did not answer, but he frowned as the three children approached. He had good reason to quarrel with his sister, but that did not mean he approved of quarreling. The oldest of the three joined the squabble. I get him because I'm the oldest. You two can have bad dog. The dog, hearing his name, lifted his head, decided nothing of importance was happening, and dropped it again. The younger girl, who was wearing her sister's outgrown shorts and blouse, objected. Just because you're the oldest, you always think you can have everything. No fair, shouted the boy. Bad dog belongs to all of us. Debbie unhooked the kitten's claws from her t-shirt and tried to hide them behind her back. Socks struggled. Until this morning, Debbie had always been careful to support his feet, but when she held him, she had never had squeezed before. I want the one, I want that one with the white feet, said the girl. Sorry. I want that one with white feet that the girl is hiding, said the older girl. Me too, me too, the boy jumped up and down and clutched his swimming trunks, which his mother had brought for him to grow into. I know, the younger sister had found a solution. Mommy can buy each of us a kid, kitten. That's what you think, said the weary mother. One is plenty. We'll take the one with the white feet. Socks had almost wiggled free when a second pair of hands seized him. He felt himself being lifted. Metal creaked and his hand thrusted into the darkness, and he found himself falling. He landed onto something smooth and dark. He landed on something smooth in the dark, stifling place. Above, he heard a creak and a clang. Outside, he heard a shouting and the sound of Debbie's bursting into tears. The strangest thing had happened to Socks that morning. He mailed him, cried the small boy. That big boy mailed the kitten I wanted. The one I wanted, contradicted his big sister. Cut it out, you kids, said the mother. The little sister shrieked, Mommy, he hit me. Now she had her brother in the wrong. Socks slipped and slid on the letters that crackled, crackled beneath his paws as he explored the dark mailbox. The place was sweltering, but it was free from other kittens. And for the first time in seven weeks of life, Socks had found a place where no one could step on his face or bite his tail. He lay down on the letters to catch up on the rest he had been missing that morning. Outside, the commotion continued. I'm fed up with you kids fighting all the time, said the mother. Just for that, we won't buy a kitten at all. All three kids protested. No fair. You said you'd buy us a kitten. You promised. Please, Mommy, just one. We won't fight anymore. Honest. Come along, said the mother, relieved to have an excuse for leaving the kitten behind. I'll buy you popsicles. I need a kitten like a hole in the head. This decision was followed by shouts of, I want lime. I want grape. 
I don't want a popsicle. I want a Slurpee. Socks was discovering that the heat inside the box made sleep impossible. The chute at the top opened. Socks, are you all right down there? Socks recognized a tearful voice as Debbie, even though it sounded loud and hollow. Then she demanded of her brother, how are we going to get him out? He'll roast if we leave him in there. He'll starve. He'll die. She tried to cool the box by opening and closing the creaky chute. You didn't want a bunch of fighting kids to get him, did you? Asked George. You wanted to go to a good home, don't you? How can we sell him when he's in the mailbox? Asked Debbie. Nobody can see him. Look, said George. It says on the box that the mail will be picked up at 11. 11.23 a.m. The clock in the market says it's 11.15. All we have to do is wait for the mailman to unlock the box and we'll get socks back. There was a loud sniff outside the mailbox. Are you sure the mailman will give him back? Hope and respect for her brother had replaced fear and angry in Debbie's voice. Sure, I'm sure, said George. The post office doesn't want kittens any more than anyone else. I hope nobody wants to mail a package before 11.23. It might hit socks. The tears were gone from Debbie's voice. Nice, fresh kitchen kittens for sale, she called out as she tried to fan air into the mailbox. Socks stretched out panting and puzzled by all that had happened. A letter falling from above was only another puzzlement, but the heat forced him to mew in distress. Hang on, Socks, Debbie's voice echoed down the chute. Help is coming. At a precisely 23 minutes after 11, as he lay gasping on the letter, Socks was frightened by the sound of a key rattling against metal. Before he could move, the side of the box dropped down, and he lay blinking in the glare of the sun before an audience of shoppers. Well, how about that, said the driver of the mail truck when he saw the kitten. Socks, cried Debbie, rescuing her kitten from the letters. Don't you know it's a federal offense to tamper with the United States mails? Asked the driver as he scooped the mail into his bag. Debbie looked so alarmed that he said, Relax, I'm only joking. A kitten doesn't count as mail. Unless he has stamps stuck on him. And even then, I'm not sure. So there they all are. You can kind of see it. Right there in the middle in the mailbox. There's a little tiny kitten. And they're all looking at him. The scene attracted more shoppers. A young couple pushing a cart of groceries towards the parking lot paused to watch what was going on. Debbie, trusting their appearance, held up Socks for their inspection. This is Socks, she said. We named him Socks because he looks like he's wearing white socks. He's the smartest ki kitten in the bunch, said George, his voice brimming with hope. If they sold one kitten, they could sell more, and he would be free to go to the library. Unaware that his future was about to be decided, Sock struggled and mewed to be put down. Debbie would not let him go. See, she said to the young couple, he likes you. Look at his little paws and his little pointy tail, cried the young woman, whose name was Marilyn Bricker. And look at his beautiful markings, those black stripes on his head and that black ring around his tail like the rings of a raccoon's tail and those little white socks. Oh, Bill, we must take him. We need a cat to sleep in front of the fireplace this winter now that we have a house. He's a very smart kitten, George pressed for a sale. He's housebroken, too. I've always wanted a kitten when I was a kid, remarked Bill Bricker, but my mother didn't like cats. Then you should have one now. Then you should have a kitten now, said his wife. Debbie and George exchanged a look that wiped away their disagreements of the morning. They were about to sell a kitten. Miss Bricker reached into her pocket of his jeans for change. Fifty cents is the best offer I can make. He said with a smile. Oh, that's all right. Debbie was willing to be generous. Daddy said to give them away if I had to. Thank you, said George, as he accepted two 25-cent pieces. Debbie felt she should say something to make the transaction official. Satisfaction guaranteed or your money? She thought better of what she was about to say and instead handed the kitten to Mrs. Bricker. Bye, Socks, she said. Be a good kitten. Socks found himself cuddled, not squeezed in the arms of the strange... Mrs. Bickers, while George said to his sister, Look, if you're ever going to learn to make change, you've got to learn that 50 cents is a lot more than 20, lot more than 20 cents. Socks, did you hear what the girl said? Miss Bricker struck, struck the, tabby's marked, the tabby's markings on the tiny head. She said satisfaction guaranteed. Socks' eyes were closing. He was worn out by all that had happened that morning. To us or to the kitten, asked Mrs. Bricker as he lifted the bags of groceries over the tailgate of the old station wagon. To the kitten, of course, Marilyn Bricker laughed affectionately. 
I know you and your heart of jello. All right, so that chapter kind of introduced us to three important people. First one being Socks, you know, the main cat, who was supposedly a really smart one. And he was being sold by two people. Who were those? Debbie and George, the brother and sister. They hid him. Where did they hide Socks? Because there was those horrible kids that came up, and they're like, arguing over who was going to get which kitten and they all wanted socks and so what did George do with socks? He threw them down the mailbox. And then socks was like getting overheated and it wasn't good but at least he was safe from the kids. And when the mailman showed up we met our other two important people. Mr. and Mrs. Bricker and they bought him for 50 cents which was more than the 20 cents that they were asking. It's actually more than a 25 cents, what they originally were asking. So that's where we kind of left off. So let's see what happens with our friend Socks. Chapter 2, The Bricker's Other Pet. The Brickers drove Socks to a shabby house with a weedy lawn, a fragrant lemon bush, and geraniums growing in earth, comfortable for a kitten to dig. They made a bed for Socks from a carton, an old sweatshirt, and placed it in the laundry beside his dish. They did not object when he chose instead to sleep on the couch in the living room, which, except for the chair with Loopy's upholstery, was furnished in what the Brickers described to their college student friends as contemporary cast-off. They, they fed him canned and dried cat foods and bought raw meat for him. They wiped their, his paws with good bath towels whenever he came in with wet feet because they had not been married long enough to have old bath towels and when the winter rains came, they supplied him with a pan of kitty litter. The Brickers talked to their cat. Socks, you're getting a lot of service around here, said Mr. Bricker, as he left his studies to get down on his knees, hands and knees and retrieve the ping pong ball. Socks had batted under the chest of drawers, chest of drawers, out of the reach of his paws. Such silky fur, Mrs. Bricker spoke in her just for Socks voice, as she left off typing to press her cheek against his coat and let her long hair fall over him like a curtain. Sock's throat throbbed with purrs. He was especially happy when he could interrupt her work on the papers that she typed for students. Her typewriter were, was her rival for her attention, and Socks did not like rivals. The only real unpleasantness in Socks' new life was an unhappy day spent in a veterinary's hospital, which was soon forgotten. Socks thrived. His eyes changed from blue to the color of new leaves. He grew into a sleek cat, affectionate towards his loving owners, but firm about getting his own way. He was, at the, he was the center of the Bricker's household, and he was content. Then a strange thing happened. Miss Bricker's lap began to shrink. One day, Socks was perfectly comfortable resting on her knees. The next day, he didn't have quite enough space. Each time he napped on her lap, he had to curl himself into a tighter ball with his tail wrapped more closely around his body. Finally, one evening, when he's trying to find room to rest his chin, he lost his balance and fell to the floor with a thump. Both brickers burst out laughing. Socks was insulted. He turned his back and twitched his tail back and forth across the carpet to show his displeasure. Poor Socks, said Mrs. Bricker between giggles. You lost your dignity, didn't you? Come on, old boy, coaxed Mr. Bricker. Try my lap for size. He moved his chair away from his desk to make room. The tail twitched. The brickers would have to work harder before Socks would forgive them. <clears throat> Owners must be disciplined. If they really wanted to be forgiven, they would have to tempt him with a snack from the refrigerator. Instead of going to the kitchen, Mrs. Brickers suddenly said in an urgent voice, Bill, it's time to go. Are you sure? Mr. Bricker's voice registered excitement, worry, and joy at all at the same, all at once. Socks waited. These people had to learn. I'm positive, said Mrs. Bricker in a small, scared voice. This is it. With great dignity, Socks stalked to the one piece of furniture forbidden to him, the chair with the loopy upholstery. He placed his four paws on the chair and arched his back and pulled. Rip. Rip, rip. There. The Brickers gave Socks attention, but not in the way he expected. He found himself snatched up, carried down the hall, and tossed into a dark laundry beside his pan of kitty litter. The door shut after him. Sorry, old boy, said Mr. Bricker as he gave the room an extra push to make sure it was latched. 
After a moment of shocked silence, Sox let out a yell of rage and waited for a release. He could hear the brickers talking in quick, anxious voices. He could hear the whir, whir, whir of the telephone dial, but he did not hear anyone coming down the hall to let him out. Socks meowed his loudest, crossest meow. Footsteps hurried the front door, slammed out of the on the driveway. The old station wagon started, died, started again, and drove away. The house was silent. So was Socks. After months of catnip and kidneys, and kidney of service and attention, to be treated like this. In the days that followed, Mister Bricker dumped food into Socks' dish nearly early. Socks, socks dish early in the morning before he left the house and again at night after he returned but in between socks was alone he waited on the windowsill he slept he honed his claws on the forbidden chair although the that although the sport was gone the ringing of the telephone made him anxious when no one was home to answer the buzzing of the doorbell frightened him so that he hid under the bed but he need not have bothered now no one came to open the door socks lost interest in food his ping pong ball was no longer amused him Without love, he was bewildered and ejected. Then, late one morning, Sox was roused by, from a doze, a doze by the slam of the station wagon door on the driveway and a sound of the voices of both of his owners. With glad meows, he sprang from the couch. As soon as the door opened, Sox was outside, his forepaws against, Mrs. forepaws against Miss Bricker's thigh, stretching up to be petted. A light breeze ruffled his fur, and spring sunshine drew the fragrance from the lemon blossoms. Life was good again. Did you miss me, Socks? Mrs. Bricker stooped to rub the hollow behind his ears, where his fur grew short and fine. Were you lonesome without me? She asked. Socks' throat pulsated with purrs. He rubbed against her leg back and forth and round and round as she entered the house. He could not even get enough petting to satisfy his pent-up loneliness. I missed you, too, said Mrs. Bricker in such an understanding voice that Socks felt... He must take advantage of her. With a hopeful meow, he started towards the kitchen, paused, and looked back to encourage her to follow him to the refrigerator. Until that moment, he had been so happy to see his family that he had not noticed the bundle in Mr. Bricker's arms. Socks hes hesitated. Which was more important? A tidbit from the refrigerator? Or his right to investigate everything that came into the house? Curiosity won, and he turned back. See what we've brought, said Mr. Bricker. A smacking noise came from inside of the bundle. Instantly, Socks was alert. There was something alive in there. His spine prickled, and he paused to sniff cautiously. Mrs. Bricker folded back the blanket, and Mr. Bricker leaned over so, so Socks could see. He saw, a small, he saw a creature with small, wrinkled, furless face and a sight that made his hair stand on end. His eyes grew large, and his backed away. Whatever the thing was, he did not trust it. As Sox stared at the strange creature in the bundle and listened to its smack, to its smack and snuffle, he began to understand his owners, his faithful, loving owners, had brought home a new pet to threaten his position in the household. So, there he is, looking at the bundle. He's very curious. What do you think it is? Socks turned his back and lashed his swollen tail. He was filled with jealousy and anger and terrible anxieties. The Brickers might love the new pet more than they loved him. Poor Socks, Mrs. Baker stooped to smooth his fur, but Socks moved away from her hand. An unhappy wail came from the bundle. Oh dear, he can't be hungry already. The worry in Mrs. Bricker's voice was a new sound to Socks. He sure can, said Mr. Bricker as he sat down on the couch with the wailing bundle on the lap that had always belonged to Socks. Listen to him. You can tell he has a fine pair of lungs. Socks turned his back and began washing, began washing to pass the time until he made up his mind how to regain the lap from the new pet. On her way to the kitchen, Mrs. Bricker spoke in a special voice higher than her normal voice that she had always used for her cat. I'm hurrying, she said. I'll have your bottle in a minute. Socks paused in his washing with one paw until with one paw behind his ear until he understood that this time he was she was not speaking to him. A slight that hurt him mu almost as much as the loss of the lap. He scrubbed his paw back and forth against his nose until he could contain his longing for re reassurance no longer. 
Alert and ready to run at the first sign of danger, Sox crept cautiously towards Mr. Bricker, who reached for the bottle his wife had brought from the kitchen and said, Let me feed him. You sit down and rest. Mr. Mrs. Bricker sat down, but she did not rest. Are you sure you know how to feed him? She asked. Both parents spoke of the baby as he, as if he were a stranger whose name they had not caught. Nothing to it, Mr. Bricker offered the bottle to his son. Greedy smacks came from the bundle. Hey, look at him net go, said the proud new father. Socks took a chance. He leaped into the center of the couch, cautiously set one paw on Mr. Bricker's knees, leaned forward, and sniffed a sweet, melty fra fragrance. Careful, Socks, warned Mr. Bricker's. You can look, but don't come too close. Socks stared at the tiny, wrinkled face with a mixture of fear, curiosity, and jealousy. He saw the baby open his eyes and raise one nightgown-covered fist, as if he did not know it belonged to him. He saw the baby's head wobble and his eyes cross. Socks began to understand that the creature was not a pet, but a new kind of person, a person so small that he left rooms up on the lap for a cat very well. They would share the lap, but his but this concession did not mean he liked the new person. Socks felt that half a lap was better than none. Socks put a second paw on Mr. Bricker's knees and with his eyes half closed began to knead and purr. Ouch. Both of Mr. Bricker's hands were occupied. Take your claws out of my leg. Socks found himself listed, lifted by Mr. Mrs. Bricker and sat on the floor without so much of a kind word. He resumed his washing to show his owners that he had business of his own to take care of. Let them attend to theirs. He would attend to his. He groomed his tail with long, hard rasps of his pink tongue. The baby's smacking changed to fussing and another sound new to Socks. He hoisted his hind legs and went to work on his toes while he observed all that was going on. Beyond his hoisted leg, he could see Mrs. Bricker leaning anxiously over the baby. Maybe he needs to be burped, she said. Mr. Bricker held up, a bo held up the bottle. You're right. He's taken two ounces. He set in the bottle on the table and at the end of the couch, raised the baby to his shoulder and began to pat its head. Still the baby fussed. Mr. Bricker patted harder. Socks lowered his leg. There was plenty of room on the lap. No, better not risk reclaiming it so soon. He went on with his grooming, but he began to grow uneasy. He wanted the frightings to stop the same way he wanted. He always wanted the ring of the telephone or the buzzing of the doorbell to be silenced. Try rubbing instead of patting, suggested the anxious mother. The father rubbed. The fussing became a wail. Mr. Brickers rubbed the tiny bag, and Mrs. Bricker patted. Socks became anxious to have that crying stop that he no longer could pay attention to his washing. Maybe we don't pat the, way, the right way, said the mother. How else can you pat? The father was beginning to see that there was more to feeding a baby than he had realized. Socks took a chance and leaped up to fill the lap, which was going to waste. Miss Bricker promptly returned him to the floor. Socks was deeply hurt. Filled with sorrow and longing, he lay down on the carpet with his chin on his fore on his white forepaw, and stared into the black, empty fireplace. He yearned to be held and stroked and assured. He longed to have a master hold him and play with his tail, and Socks was most particular about allowing people to play with his tail. With a deep sigh, Socks closed his eyes, but he did not sleep. His ears, moving like tiny, tiny radar screens, picked up every sound. What are we going to do, Mrs. Bricker sounded almost terrible. If we don't get the air bubble up, his stomach will go on hurting, and he's too little to hurt. Feeding a baby can't be this hard. The father no longer sounded confident. The world is full of dumbbells who feed babies. How else do babies survive? Try putting your face down across your knees, suggested Mrs. Bricker. Mrs. Bricker. I saw somebody do that once. The radar ears caught the soft sound of the baby being moved, followed by the gentle padding. Try rubbing, suggested the hovering mother again. Suddenly the baby belched. Startled, Socks raised his head and stared. The whole family was relieved. The baby, the mother, and the father, who were all beaming at the miraculous thing their baby had done. Socks was relieved, too, because at last the crying had stopped. Charles William, Mrs. Bricker spoke to her accomplished son by name. Oh, such a big noise from such a little fellow. a boy, Mrs. Bricker congratulated his son. That's the old fight. The atmosphere of the room had changed from one of anxiety to one of joy, which Socks felt was his to share. The time 
The time he stood at Mrs. Brick, Mr. Bricker's feet and looked up uncertainly as if to say, I'm part of the family too, the Brickers were too busy to notice. Why, Charles Williams is asleep already, whispered Mrs. Bricker. She bent over her son. Here, let me take him. I'll put him down in the crib. Now, thought Socks. Now, with the new person out of the room, he would regain the lap. Before he could jump, however, Mr. Bricker picked up the bottle, which still held several ounces of the baby's formula, and started towards the kitchen. Socks got there first and sat down beside the refrigerator. See how patiently I am waiting beside our refrigerator, his attitude seemed to say. Mr. Bricker unscrewed the top from the bottle. Socks, it isn't time for you to eat, he said, and was about to dump the formula into the sink when Socks uttered such a wistful meow that he changed his mind. Mr. Bricker found a bowl, poured the formula into it, and carried it into the laundry where his feet crunched through the kitty litter that Socks had scattered the night before. He set the bowl on the newspaper beside Socks' dish. Socks crouched and began to lap the sweet-smelling milk with his, pink, with his quick pink tongue. Did you think we had forgotten you, asked Mr. Bricker. Although Sox did not care to be interrupted while eating, this time he made an exception and gave his master a long stare that said, How could you bring that new person into our house? Now you have spoiled everything. Sad and confused, Sox went back to his lapping up the formula in the bowl. The warmth and sweetness of the milk comforted him. He lapped every drop and then licked the empty dish so hard that he moved it across the newspaper until it bumped the wall. Socks needed every drop of consolation he could get. His owner loved the baby more than they loved him. Okay. So, Socks, the, well, the name of it was the Bricker's Other Pet. So Socks was left alone for a while, and he only saw them, like, only saw Mr. Bricker, not Mrs., just come in in the morning and then in the evening when he came back home. And that was it. So he was starting to feel lonely. And the Brickers brought something home. What was it that they brought home? Yeah, they brought the baby home. The baby named Charles Williams. Sox is pretty jealous, right? He's giving them all kinds of attitude. Um... So we're going to see how Sox and Charles Williams and the Brickers all get along throughout the rest of the book. Uh, so we're going to stop at that chapter today, and we'll pick up the next time. Thanks.